What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another car review. This is of course the 2019 Volkswagen GTI. Huge thanks to Volkswagen for providing me with the 2019 GTI here to review for you guys today. So about the GTI, well, exterior wise, nothing is new for 2019. So if you watch my 2018 review, you know, back in 2017, that's when these got these uh, slight revisions to the exterior and interior to freshen it up a little bit, uh, but it still looks fantastic. You know, you still have these LED headlamps here on all but the base trim now, and those are really great. Um, you do also have these, uh, you know, front bumpers that has the black uh, little inserts in them, which I really love as well as a little bit of a black lip there. You can also see that stands out nicely here on the red paint. One new thing exterior wise for 2019 you can get though is a Rabbit edition of the GTI. And so the Rabbit edition uh, is based on the base model but does give you the LED headlamps and a few other nice features as well as a bunch of black accents. But anyway, getting back to this Audubon trim here, I still love the way it looks up front there. And uh, you know, out back it's still again very much true to the original GTIs. You know, they're very evolutionary with their styling changes. I love that it's still a square boxy hatchback shape and uh, you and it looks great. I especially love the chrome exhaust tips you have there in the lower part of the rear bumper that helps to set this apart from normal GTIs. And although the GTI has always been one of the more conservative choices as far as hot hatches go, um, this one, you know, I think it stands out a little bit more than it has in the past and uh, really uh, just still looks really great to me to this day. The rest of the interior of the GTI. So like I said, nothing really new for 2019, but I'll briefly summarize everything here. First off are these seats, which are very nice seats. One of the best parts of the GTI interior. I just love how much thigh support you have, uh, but the torso support is also excellent and so much sportier than standard golf seats and just feel really good. They hug you in so nicely and here in the Audubon trim, nicely trimmed in leather. They're also heated, which I believe is a standard feature on all GTIs here for 2019. And so very nice, but uh, one thing I will say is you know, this one, again, being in the $37,000 range, to not have ventilated seats when there's much cheaper competitors that have uh, cooled seats uh, is kind of a sore exclusion here. I realize that the GTI is very dated, you know, since it debuted back in 2014 for the 2015 model year. Um, but still, it would have been nice for them to incorporate that over the years here uh, because that's just one feature that's sorely missing in a vehicle that is as expensive as this is. Next, though, is the steering wheel here in the GTI, which is still just wonderful. I love this flat bottom, all the metal accents, the wonderful stitching, and I like the fact that it's a nice thin wheel. You know, they didn't try and go overboard. Uh, it's just nice and thin, but has a spectacular 93 grip. Just feels so good in your hands. I absolutely love it. The GTI has been getting more and more expensive over the years, and uh, as the price goes up, this interior gets harder and harder to justify. So it's interesting, you know, you have this nice soft padding up here around the steering column, but then you can see this horrible drop off and this like gap where it just drops down and then it's hard plastic, just in time for it to be hard for your knee here. So it's kind of unfortunate. I really, I mean, no one really touches around, um, you know, the uh, steering uh, column area here. So I kind of wish that, that was hard plastic and they put the soft stuff down here by your knees, which you would actually be coming in contact with quite a bit. Stuff like Mazda 3s these days have padding down here and you don't get that here in a GTI that again is nearly $37,000. But again, we are due for a new one fairly soon. So, um, you know, can't complain too much. One really nice thing here, you still have these great analog gauges, which look great. You have a little color display in the middle there. And um, it does show you a lot of information. It'll show you your media, your navigation instructions. Um, also a few, uh, you know, driver trip information type things but no performance metrics in there unfortunately which would be nice to see but we don't have any of that um, but you know nice to have the digital, digital speedometer and a couple of other things there and so overall you know just a solid set of gauges but nothing that'll really wow you coming over to the center here though this is one of the really nice improvements they made last year that um, is really good looking is this 8 inch infotainment display uh, and I love the capacitive touch buttons there's only a few of them so I feel like they're fairly easy to touch although some people might complain it's more distracting than physical buttons I think it really looks great but I love that they still have retained physical volume and tune knobs which is something that some of the other competitors don't always have I love that it has that. I also like that it is a proximity sensitive. So it'll actually bring up additional menus just by my finger approaching the screen before I even touch it. So that's kind of a cool touch. I also like how it's, you know, standard Apple CarPlay and Android Auto here. So you can do all your smartphone integration. Otherwise, you know, just a very good menus here. I've always liked this Volkswagen system. Um, again, it could use a little bit of an update, especially like the navigation maps and stuff are starting to look a little dated. Um, but otherwise, you know, it does look very good. And again, that's something they'll probably get upgraded 
upgraded here with the new generation version coming out uh, in a couple of years here. But overall, great there. And then you just have your standard auto climate control here, which is good to have. One thing that is pretty good here in the GTI as well is storage space. So you have massive pockets in the doors with an enormous bottle holder, probably the biggest in the segment, just eyeballing it. But I mean, it's huge, really great. And coming over to the center here, you have this little uh, pocket which is rubberized and pretty deep. So you could fit a smartphone or something in there. That's also where you'll find your USB jack. So nice to kind of, you can put that in your phone all nicely hidden away in there. I will say that that space is not large enough for a hard uh, sunglass case. So if you have one of those clamshell style hard sunglass cases like I do, it will not fit in there. Um, and it won't fit in any of the other po pockets in here. So you're forced to use the sunglasses holder up here with your sunglasses, uh, you know, just being in there uh, exposed. And that's the only way you can uh, store those at least in any of these cubbies. Otherwise though, you have a power outlet here behind the shifter and two uh, cup holders. And then uh, you also do have by your left knee here, another little drop down uh, pocket, but that is also not large enough for a sunglass case, but uh, nice to have nonetheless. Anyway, coming back to the middle, you have this center armrest, which is very nice and softly padded. Great for resting your elbow on. You open that up and then you'll see a space that's pretty small. Again, not large enough for any kind of sunglass case, but it is usable. It's just, you know, not as great as I would like. And I would say this is about two thirds the size of the average uh, center cubby in this segment. So a little small these days. Um, and a lot of the other competitors do have larger stuff, but good to have nonetheless. And this also does slide forwards and backwards. So you can really have it at any position you want uh, to perfectly support your elbow there. And so, um, you know, all things considered again, for a vehicle as small as this is, I think it does have a lot of really great little cubbies, um, but it would be nice to have something slightly larger. Another thing that's really good is the back seat space here in the GTI. So uh, I'm five foot nine, me sitting behind myself. I have about three inches of leg room to spare there. So it's actually roomier than it might look from the outside. And I actually have plenty of headroom as well, thanks to the bo boxy shape there. It's pretty nice back there as well. So you have bottle holders in those doors back there. There's a fold down center armrest with two cup holders built into it. There's also a ski pass through there in the middle if you want. Looking forward, you'll also see two air vents, which is kind of rare in this segment to have air vents back there. So that's uh, great to kind of give the rear seat occupants a little more control over uh, their comfort. That's about it otherwise back there, you know, but they do have a great view looking forward to because you have this uh, very oversized moon roof. I think they call it a panoramic roof, but it's not quite, you know, the full length of the roof. Uh, it's about half that long, but it's still a really nice large sunroof and larger than what you usually get. And um, so overall, a really great back seat trunk space in the GTI is also very good. So it's a uh, your average hatchback size uh, shape there. Nothing uh, to write home about, but should get the job done just fine. And there's little pockets there on the left and on the right. Um, and then when you open up that floor there, you will see uh, your spare tire, which is great to still have, considering that's something that uh, isn't always standard in these vehicles, uh, you know, from other competitors. But uh, it's also how you can see, you can actually lower the floor a little bit if you're not worried about having a flat load floor with the seats folded down. That's why they have it slightly raised there. You can lower that and then you have a much deeper area by you know about an inch or two and so that's good. Um, helps you to stack things a little bit more efficiently and um, so good to have that versatility there and so again for the size of vehicle we're in I think it does use its space very very well um, but compared to some of the larger hatches and things out there um, it's not going to knock your socks off either. All right so start up and go for a drive. The GTI here has this very nice uh, key that actually has the GTI there and it's metal. It has a really nice weight to it. It's a very weighty key. It feels great. It also is still a switch plate key if you want to do that, but this one has the keyless access. Keyless entry, push button, start. So you just leave this key in your pocket, hit the engine start button, and it starts right up. All right, so setting off in the 2019 Volkswagen GTI. So first thing you notice, well, this one is the DSG, but the big news for 2019 is it's now a seven speed DSG dual clutch automatic instead of the uh, six speed it used to have last year. So that is one of the biggest changes here for 2019. And I'll be testing that out. One thing I will say though, is that you can still kind of tell it's a dual clutch if you're a car enthusiast, um, but it's very smooth. And I have to say, this is probably the smoothest dual clutch outside of Porsche PDK. Um, so it's a very, very good transmission, very, smooth. Um, does like to bog down a little bit and I feel like it's similar to PDK in that regard. Now uh, elaborate more on that here. 
when we get out onto an open road. But, um, you know, it just is a very good thing and very easy to drive too. A very just enjoyable vehicle to drive because of how good visibility is. That's one of the greatest things about the GTI, I think, still at least. Is it does visibility better than all of the competitors out there. I mean, you have a massive windshield, you have uh, pretty thin A pillars here with a speaker built into them, and then you have another little A pillar window there, which is great. Although it's not super big, um, it is nice to have something there and also to have the mirror not attached to the A pillar. So, yeah, it's nicely opened up. And then, view out of the back is also, you know, very good. It's just a nice square window, very easy to see out of. And so, the GTI just, you know, has very small dimensions. So, it feels very maneuverable uh, in tight areas, just feels very easy to drive. You know, this would be great for a first time uh, driver. And it's also just a very comfortable vehicle too, you know, we're cruising on a main road here now and um, I mean the ride is just, it's definitely better I think than all the competitors pretty easily and I think this one has a slight advantage because this Audubon trim here has the dynamic chassis control which is still only reserved for those higher trims. Um, but it really, I think, kind of helps to smooth out the ride. Now, it's not a mind-blowing difference, but I think it really does kind of filter out some of the extra vibrations and stuff that you usually would get um, with, you know, a less refined suspension setup. And, um, so as a daily driver, this is one of the reasons why the GTI is so popular um, as a daily driver because it's just it's so comfortable, it's just great to drive, it's easy to drive, and it's also pretty quiet in here as well. So you know all you're hearing really is the air conditioning uh, going pretty hard since we're at 91 degrees Fahrenheit outside. We have a little bit of road noise, but I mean for again a vehicle of this class and segment, I think it's uh, right in line and again a little bit above what you get with most of the others. But I'm gonna go ahead and put it up into the uh, sport driving mode and also put the transmission into its sport mode here and uh, let's turn down onto this back road and see how it does and here we go all right there we go then full strong so for a uh, good solid like two to three seconds there. It almost felt like it was slipping the clutch. Like I wasn't getting full power, I was holding back. Maybe that was an attempt to limit wheel spin. I don't know, we'll have to try turning off trash control here and see if it uh, is a little more eager, but listen to that. Got a little blow off valve going. That's pretty sweet. That's the loudest factory blow off valve I think I've ever heard. I don't remember that being present last year. Interesting. So maybe that's part of, you know, again, this engine has been uh, retuned a little bit. 228 horsepower now from this 2-liter turbocharged four-cylinder, 258 pound-feet of torque, and it'll do 0 to 60 in about 5.7 seconds. Uh, I'm not sure if that was with the old 6-speed DSU or the 7 here, um, but that was just, you know, one of the times put out by a recent publication. But um, no matter what, you're going to be around that type of, uh, you know, range as far as your performance goes. And, um, I'll say it feels about that fast, just again, it just seems like it's hesitant to put down the power there for that first few thousand RPM before it, you really feel it sinking its teeth into the road and actually going for it. But it is very meaty and I like the growl it has too. It almost has like a little bit of like a WRX kind of sound to it almost. And sounds really good. All right, so this time I have trash control deactivated, so we'll try and see if it'll be a little more eager this time. And here we go. like it's holding back on me in this first few thousand RPM. So maybe that's something a tune would help out with, you know, just helping to unleash all that power right off the bat. Because it really, you know, it kind of limits, you don't get that smack in the back type of feeling that you're expecting. I mean, this isn't a slow vehicle, with almost 260 pound feet of torque, it should be able to move pretty quickly, especially considering these only weigh about 3,100 pounds. I think this one's 3,128 to be exact in this fully loaded Audubon trim, which is a little heavier. It's very controlled even with trash control off. I mean, it's not trying to break the wheels loose, you have no traction issues, which is it's actually a, a, impressive considering we're only running 225 wide tires here and they're just Bridgestone Patens is nothing super sporty or sticky and so I guess that uh, just comes down to the way they tuned um, you know the front end of this vehicle to really put down that power well but um, yeah kind of interesting I, I do wish that it, it was a little more savage than it is though. I'll go ahead and put it in the manual mode here though and try some manual shifts see how those feel. very very quick that is one thing that's very impressive is this dual clutch it's so smooth and it is so quick 
it's quick enough that you could actually just drive this like it was only paddle shift only and didn't have an automatic mode uh, because it is that good. I never am waiting for it here. It's really sharp with its response. Both downshifts and upshifts are excellent. And so that's very good. So I'm glad that's been improved because I do remember that with the 2018 that I reviewed, um, that one, every once in a while, the transmission wouldn't be giving me a shift as fast as I was expecting it. But starting off from a stop, sometimes this engine bogs down and then we'll spring into action. But I kind of wish, sometimes I'm, I'm waiting for a downshift. That's one thing. Every once in a while, it wants it wants to rely on the torque and the turbo before it will give me a downshift. And I mean, obviously, this is a very quick manual shift uh, vehicle, so I could just pull a paddle and get a downshift. But it still would just be nice if it just could figure it out and be a little more, uh, I guess, rev happy. And it's not. Instead, it really wants to rely on those lower RPMs and then give you the power. And so that's a little bit of a minor frustration I'm starting to notice here. Um, I do love this uh, transmission. I think with maybe a little bit of tuning logic change, uh, you know, it could maybe, you know, be a lot better. So maybe aftermarket, you know, do a transmission tune, do a tune to the uh, engine to uncork that, you know, extra power in those lower RPMs. And then, uh, you know, you'd really have a spe spectacular vehicle. Now, obviously I love manual transmissions. You can still get a manual in every version of the GTI here, I believe. So I would wholeheartedly endorse the manual and say, just get that uh, because it's a really great manual. It's been a while since I've driven the manual on those, but it, it is a great manual and would be uh, probably my choice no matter what, unless you sit in a ton of grueling stop and go traffic, then go for the automatic here. It still is better than most dual clutches out there, but but, um, you know, still to me falls short of, you know, what I would want from an ideal perfect automatic. It's not perfect in my eyes, um, but I guess you could always, if you absolutely do not want a clutch pedal, just, you know, put it in manual mode here and just manually shift it yourself and then a spectacular. Um, but other things in here, one of the, the main things about the GTI is the handling of it. So we're coming from some corners here and they're very windy, hilly corners that kind of upset the balance of vehicles very, very well. And um, this vehicle, it really handles well. That's the main thing about the GTI. And you know, it's not even on super sporty tires. So if you had some stickier tires, it would be even better. But with its dynamic chassis control and its sport mode, very little body roll. Really in any of the driving modes, you don't have much body roll. Really the thing I'm noticing most about the dynamic chassis control of the different drive modes really is that you just have um, basically heavier steering is the biggest thing that I notice about sport mode here um, but it does feel a little flatter and there's you know normal and then comfort as well and those do maybe isolate things a little bit but I'm really splitting hairs and uh, you know it would take a lot of time um, you know if you blindfolded someone for them to be able to figure out you know the difference between one mode and the other as far as ride comfort so I don't think that's a game changer to have the dynamic chassis control um, but it does you know feel really good I mean around these corners since it's so light I mean it is really nice and tossable and you know again because of the spectacular visibility as well I mean it just feels like you're driving around this bubble it has very very high limits and um, this feels really good to pitch into corners you know it it uh, feels solid despite the fact that it's pretty light you know so even though this is around the same weight as something like a Hyundai Veloster Turbo or something like that um, you know, those are a little dartier feeling, which can be fun. And I think, you know, for an autocross setup or if you really want to have a back red scarver, I think I still do prefer the lighter feel of those Hyundais. Uh, the Loster N is uh, head and shoulders above this as far as handling goes. But this does handle very well on its own. Another thing I really love about the GTI is you have really great throttle response here in it. Uh, I mean, this engine is so torquey, so it's always ready to just dive right in and give you a shove as long as the transmission's up for it. Um, and then brakes also have really meaty feel to them. I mean, really strong feeling brakes. And I love that they're kind of this rubberized and metal texture too. So when you actually are putting your foot on the brake pedal, uh, it just feels really solid. Same goes for the gas pedal. Just that's one of the things that does feel a little higher quality. So those little details that Volkswagen does, which do set it apart from a lot of the competitors. Everything about this vehicle, it kind of fades into the background. It, does, it has these like superpowers in a way where it's, you know, it's not showy about the fact that it just does everything very well. It's not a vehicle that, um, you know, is going to disappoint you in any way, um, but it's not going to really blow your mind either. It's just going to do everything you ask of it most of the time, like I said, aside from this transmission um, and the fact that you're waiting for power. I mean, there we go. I kind of provoked some wheel spin there. 
Ah, but it's just, yeah, and then even in manual mode here, it seems to have a mind of its own where it will want to upshift uh, before I tell it to sometimes too. So, manual transmission. Get a manual if you're going to get a GTI. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, that's that's the main thing, I think. Otherwise, you know, the GTI is very good. But the thing with this Audubon trim, which I'll elaborate more on uh, later on in this video, but is the pricing of it. You know, at this one, the Audubon trim, you're really just better off going for a Golf R. The Golf R has the all-wheel drive, so, you know, you have perfect traction all the time, really. Uh, and you have way more power, so that it feels a lot more impressive. Now, this does not feel like a slash whatsoever, but um, definitely more impressive amount of power in the Golf R. And whenever you're at Audubon money, you're only spending, uh, you know, a couple thousand more tops. That's the only thing about these Audubon trims. I think the sweet spot with GTIs is to go for the base ones, especially now that the base one gets the Golf R larger brakes, that the base one gets the mechanical limit slip differential. Um, really, that's, that's like, I said, they, there's really, they just seem to have encouraged everyone to buy base model GTIs. And for good reason. You have the awesome uh, plaid seats as well, this, which I really love. And with the Rabbit Edition, which is again new for 2019, you can get all the base stuff and then also get the better headlights. Because unfortunately, the base GTI still comes with terrible halogen headlamps. And so, you know, if you want these nicer lights like you see on this one here, you're going to have to go up to the Rabbit Edition. But again, that still is keeping you safely under $30,000 for a Rabbit Edition. And then it gives you just just the stuff you need, nothing you don't, and that would be, uh, I think, my pick of the range for sure. And whenever you look at it in the context of, you know, just at $30,000 basically, this is really appealing still, and you know, still has a nicer interior than most stuff that's, you know, right at or under $30,000, and has, you know, a good bit more power than a lot of those. You know, you can't get a fully loaded Veloster Turbo, which will have cooled seats and uh, a larger panoramic moonroof and wireless charging pad and a lot of other toys you don't get here in this, but the interior is still a little bit behind in those in some ways, and, um, you know, if you go for a Veloster and currently we can only get it with a base trim here in the States, so you really have a low rent interior and that um, so you have to be okay with not having leather and not having heated seats or anything like that there are a few other competitors which i'll elaborate more on later anyway i'm going to keep driving this for an entire week and kind of ruminate more on these thoughts and then i'll come back at the end of the week here and uh, give you guys my final fuel economy average uh, out here in the real world as well as uh, anything else that i notice about the gti all right, so I've been driving the GTI for a week now, and uh, I've put 266 miles on it in that time, which is higher than I usually do, and that was thanks to a little highway trip that I did one day uh, of about 160 miles of highway driving. And so that means that a slight majority of my driving was highway. It was over 50% of my driving. And so um, that gave me a pretty good fuel economy. I'm actually getting here over the whole, you know, 267 miles of driving. My average is 27 mpg exactly and that's the combined rating you get for the GTI here is 27 and we'll do 31 on the highway if you're doing a strictly highway drive but I did do a lot of you know hard driving in the early part of my review and stop and go traffic and city driving made up you know the other half of that so that's kind of what brought that average down a little bit so I think the, the uh, fuel economy is right on par with what I was expecting honestly and if you do do just straight city driving you're only gonna be getting 25 mpg but still not bad and I think if you take it easy you can definitely still get close to that 27 um, and so this is a very economical engine for how punchy it is and I'm really impressed with that I still you know I'm not in love with the way that it limits the power there in those first two gears that is something that is a little bit annoying and I wish that it didn't do that it also just makes it feel a little weird with this dual clutch which is still very good but it is it does have a couple weird quirks so the main thing is you know the main thing with this Audubon package the biggest feature you get aside from you, know, you get navigation and um, you know one or two other small things but the main thing is the adaptive cruise control and so I wanted to test out the adaptive cruise and that was part of the reason why I went on that longer highway trip as well and the adaptive cruise system works very well it is a almost entirely full speed cruise control it will inch up in traffic which is fantastic but it doesn't come to a complete stop and this is the first adaptive cruise system I've ever used that won't actually stop like I was inching up in traffic and then whenever the traffic came to a stop eventually it was a very gradual slow stop it was like apply the brakes apply the brakes and it wouldn't do it itself and that was really strange that you know it's very relaxed and the car is doing everything for you and then all of a sudden you know you get the uh, warning that's like oh no you have to hurry up and slam on the brakes um, that was a little disconcerting and I'm not sure why the car can't 
come to a stop on its own with adaptive cruise since it is a dual clutch but that was uh, something that it just was not willing to do and so because it won't come to a full stop I can't really recommend this adaptive cruise system unless you sit in a very specific type of traffic that usually inches up but doesn't always stop now I will say it's interesting so it'll stop but then once you let off the brake it will uh, you know kind of resume a little bit on its own so it won't stay frozen stopped and require you to hit the gas to start again like some of the others but it's still just their adaptive cruise system just is a little odd and so I don't recommend it especially considering that's really the, one of the only reasons to get this Audubon trim this one is a, almost $38,000 it's $10 shy of 38 grand and so at $38,000 it just makes no sense you're better off getting an SE with the experience package that also gives you the fender stereo and the dynamic chassis control um, and then you know you have the same basic vehicle essentially for you know 34 and change so that would be the better buy I think if you must have leather and the moon roof and all kind of stuff honestly I still think the rabbit edition is the way to go because that gives you the better headlights which I think are a big deal and that's why I would skip the base trim but yeah so that's kind of where I sit as far as that goes and as far as the competition um, you know I think it also you have to keep in mind the GTIs also do frequently have discounts and just a quick scroll on Auto Trader, I was able to see that there's easily about 5,000 in discounts, uh, pretty common on these vehicles. And so, um, you know, because of that, you can get these, you know, for a good bit cheaper. And so that is something uh, to keep in mind when you consider the competition and how much the competition goes for. But even despite those discounts, this still kind of loses out to the WRX as far as value for a dollar and horsepower per dollar and stuff, since you have a slightly more horsepower in the WRX and you get all-wheel drive in the WRX. Now, obviously, if you want to hatch, uh, you're going to have much more limited options here in the States. Um, and the WRX obviously doesn't offer that anymore. But if you don't really care that much, the WRX is going to be actually groomier than this, uh, a little more spacious. The materials are close enough to the GTI. The GTI has a slight edge, but it's not a massive difference to me. But I think the GTIs are still a fantastic choice. These certainly handle better than the WRX. If you actually care about handling, um, to me, this handles much better, at least without the performance package on the WRX. Uh, I haven't driven one with the performance pack, but without it, the GTI, hands down the better handler. It's also gonna, it's lighter since it doesn't have the all wheel drive and that kind of stuff. So if you care about handling, I would certainly pick this over a Deborah X. And there's actually a few other interesting options as far as competitors that are in this price range since the GTI has gotten uh, a little bit pricier here over the years. So for example, the main competitor these days is the Hyundai Veloster and Veloster N really, since that's one that was that's the one that's the closest in horsepower, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, you would have the Focus ST if those were still sold here, but uh, you know, Ford has gotten rid of it and the Fiesta ST here for the state, so not really uh, worth comparing to, but if you are still curious, you know, Focus ST is fantastic. This handles better, I think for sure. You know, I think the Focus ST has a little bit more room to it and uh, you know it has a little bit more punch I think it's a little more of a normal feeling since it doesn't limit your power like this does and so yeah Veloster and I think you know those handle better than this because they feel lighter they're not a huge uh, weight difference but they do feel lighter but you also have a more bare bones interior since here in the States we can't get the Veloster and with any nice features so you're stuck with non heated or cooled seats you're stuck with cloth seats um, you know more basic features and so you know, if you're okay with a bare bones vehicle, I still think I would probably pick a Veloster N over this. Veloster N also has a much better sounding exhaust, a lot more crackles and pops than this exhaust is like non-existent. You get some of that induction noise and some of those little whooshes every once in a while, but it's so muted. The Veloster N is definitely louder in your face type vehicle, but there are two other unconventional competitors that I also want to bring up very briefly. One is the Honda Accord 2.0T Sport. You can get those with a manual. Now the Sport is only cloth seats. You can't get leather. So if you want the more luxurious stuff, you're going to have to, you know, go for this. But if you're okay with cloth seats, the Honda Accord actually has metal uh, volume and tune knobs and climate control knobs and all that kind of stuff. And you don't get that here in the Volkswagen. So I would actually argue that the Honda Accord's interior feels more premium than the GTI does these days. And so, um, you know, and you can get an Accord 2.0T Sport with a manual for right around 30,000 bucks. And then you have a vehicle that is going to have more punch actually than this does, more space than this does. Uh, you have a huge back seat in those versus this, which is, you know, roomy enough, but, you know, certainly not spacious by any means. And so 
Um, the Accord, I think, is a worthy competitor that's worth considering and uh, it has a really strong detuned Civic Type R engine and stuff. So another one to consider for sure. Um, and then uh, the last one actually is the Kia Stinger, not the Stinger GT, the regular four-cylinder Stinger. Those you can get, again, if you want halogen lights and stuff in the low $30,000, but if you want a premium one, it's in the higher $30,000 range. But those also have very generous discounts, thanks to it being a Kia. And so you can get one of those in the same price range as a fully loaded you know, GTI here. And the Stinger, now it's heavier and it's longer, it's a bigger vehicle, but it still handles fantastically well, especially with the lighter four-cylinder up front. That also has a ton of metal on the interior, and in the premium trim there, you still do get uh, heated and cooled seats and uh, the, you know xenon headlights the moonroof a nice stereo all that type of stuff and you have a huge hatch in the stinger that's way bigger than the one in this so you actually have more practicality with the stinger more luxury and very similar performance just slightly heavier handling all for a almost identical price here to the GTI so that is to me another um, you know appealing option if you're shopping in the low to mid thirty thousand dollar range and you want something that's got some practicality and some comfort and refinement and so another vehicle to consider and you can check out my reviews of those vehicles if you're curious to hear my in-depth thoughts on those but yeah so that's kind of you know where this sits again I think the GTI is definitely one of the better handlers it's one of the more refined vehicles I will say the dynamic chassis control that doesn't make a huge difference so that's again another reason why I would probably stray towards the lower end spectrum of the GTIs and just, just get a rabbit, you know, myself if I were to buy one of these, even on the highway trip and stuff. Comfort and normal, there was hardly any difference. I mean, some of the differences I might have been feeling could have been completely situational or imaginary. It was really not a, a noticeable difference, so I don't think you're missing out on much by not getting the dynamic chassis control personally. But yes, yeah, so that's uh, really all my thoughts here on the GTI. I still think it's a fantastic vehicle, and I think that the fact that you know this vehicle is basically five years old at this point, and it is still holding up as well as it is, is a testament to just how good the early Mark 7s were, and how good they've you know, kind of kept it up to date here. But it's, it's still just a fantastic option, certainly worth considering, especially again if you can get one um, with some substantial discounts, or if you're willing to go use Used, you know these do you know get very very affordable once they're in the used market and so yeah a very great vehicle I like the little improvements here for 2019 but again uh, still mostly the same as the other mark 7s and still just fantastic this seven speed again didn't really notice a huge difference between it and the six speed personally um, and so again I wouldn't consider that a deal breaker or a reason to upgrade either going for the seven speed so um, yeah those are my thoughts let me know your thoughts on it in the comments below thank you guys very much for watching huge thanks to Volkswagen for providing me with this GTI to review you guys today and I'll see you guys in the next one take care Thank you.